Oops. And welcome to Advantage Radio Ministries and welcome to Second Chances here at Lift FM. My name is Greg Hennis, and this is our weekly program entitled Second Chances. And if you uh, know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you do understand the Father, God, loved each and every one of us so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross so that you and I can have life and have it more abundantly. And we are privileged to have with us today Dr. Lenny Lucchetti. He is the author of the book entitled True Depth, Moving Beyond Cultural Churchianity. And Dr. Lucchetti, thank you for joining us here on Second Chances. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Greg. Now, you mentioned to me as we were just talking here before the interview began that you're a Philadelphia guy. Is that where you were born and raised? Born and raised in South Philadelphia. Yeah, not too far from uh, the old Veterans Stadium. So I'm a, I'm a diehard Eagles fan, Phillies fan, yeah. And, and I, I suppose, like the rest of us, you've been suffering for the last uh, several years. <laughs> I have, yeah. Okay. It's been a struggle with the Philadelphia sports teams lately, but uh, they're bound to get back in action. We'll see. Mm-hmm. Uh, get us started here, Dr. Lucchetti. Tell us about your upbringing in Philadelphia. Were you born into a, a Christian home, or is uh, your, your walk with the Lord, is that something that came later in life? Yeah, it's something that came later in life. My parents were, uh, were good parents in a lot of ways. Uh, I grew up nominally Catholic, uh, you know, being Italian, that's sort of what you're you're born into. But we we didn't take our faith real seriously. And um, my parents, when I was about 13, really nosedive in uh, in the drug addiction. And really, to escape the shame of their addiction, I started to uh, I dropped out of high school my junior year. Uh, began drinking. I was an alcoholic by the time I was about 17. So uh, how I came to the Lord was my, my parents actually went into uh, Teen Challenge, which is a Christian drug and alcohol rehab, and so God got a hold of their lives and helped them recover from their addiction, and then I, shortly after that, went into Teen Challenge as well, and that was my introduction to Jesus. And, and uh, I was about 18 when that happened, and then uh, not too long after that, by the age of 23, I was pastoring a church. So that happened real quick, but... Um, yeah, there's been a lot of ups and downs, lots of struggle, but lots of good times as well. Um, right now, you're a associate professor of proclamation and Christian ministries at the Wesleyan Seminary of Indiana Wesleyan University. Uh, how did you end up uh, in that particular role, and, and end up there as opposed to the staying in the Delaware Valley? Well, I've been a pastor for 15 years, most recently in northeastern Pennsylvania, uh, in the Poconos, Stroudsburg, specifically. And I love pastoring, and uh, God really uh, showed up and, and blessed the church. I was pastoring more despite me than because of me, and so we had a, a, just a great ride. We saw lots of people come to faith, um, and, and it's, it really, that was a dream church for me. We, we were a multi-ethnic church doing a lot of addiction recovery, people far from God were coming to faith, and it was real exciting. And then uh, in 2010, God uh, called me to join the faculty at Wesley Seminary to invest in those who are investing in the Church, to, to really be a pastor to pastors. So I teach most, mostly the preaching courses and uh, spiritual formation and leadership courses for pastors, and I love doing what I'm doing. I, get to, I still see myself as a pastor more than a professor, I get to pastor uh, my students, um, all of them who are pastors themselves. So uh, I never thought I never saw myself teaching full time and leaving the pastorate to do it. But here I am. You know, never say never, uh, or God will probably bring you to it. The book that we're going to talk about today is entitled "True Depth: Moving Beyond Cultural Churchianity" by Dr. Lenny Lucchetti. Uh, Lenny. Writing a book, is that something that's always been on your radar, or is that uh, something that just uh, kind of happened? You know, I hated writing. Uh, I like preaching, I like teaching, I like being in a room with people where we're dialoguing, but writing, uh, uh, at least during my college days, was something I hated and dreaded and, and was not all that good at, to be honest. Um, but, you know, I, I uh, back in 2012, uh, two years after I came to be a professor of preaching, um, I was looking for a textbook on preaching that, that framed lots of the different issues that preachers face and skills they need, and there really wasn't anything up to date uh, I felt like that would be uh, really beneficial for my students. So 
So I wrote that book. I wrote a book called Preaching Essentials. Um, and that book did really well, got a few awards. And so I thought, wow, maybe I can write. And so uh, after writing that book, which was more for pastors, I wanted to write something more devotional to help uh, lay people, uh, those who wanted to go deeper in their discipleship journey. So that's where True Depth was born. I actually, True Depth really started as a series of sermons I preached at different places. And so the book came together really as a result of uh, uh, preaching those sermons. You use the word in the title, churchianity. What exactly does churchianity mean? Well, I think of... uh, I think of two lists in my head. There's cultural churchianity and and there's biblical Christianity. And so I, I explain the differences this way. Churchianity is about getting. Uh, biblical Christianity is about giving. Cultural churchianity is more egocentric. That is, I am the center around which everything, including God, revolves. And biblical Christianity, of course, is Christocentric. Christ is the center around which everything, including myself, revolves. Uh, Cultural churchianity is about how I can be a good person. Biblical Christianity is about becoming a godly person. Uh, Cultural churchianity is about, you know, what God can do to make me happy. Uh, Biblical Christianity is about what God does to make us holy, so that holiness becomes our greatest happiness. And so at the end of the day, uh, the differences are significant, sometimes hard to detect, though, and, uh, but cultural churchianity leads churchgoers to, uh, into a shallow, boring, predictable, stale sort of religion. And uh, I think a lot of, a lot of Christians uh, who are swimming in the shallow waters of cultural churchianity are just starving for something more... Uh, they want an adventure. They want the thrill of a lifetime. And I believe that uh, discipleship, as Jesus described it in the Gospels, is uh, adventurous. It really is uh, uh, full of risk. Uh, it's not about status quo. It, it, it's, it's swimming in the deep water, water over our heads, you know. Uh, and that's what we were made for. That's the thrill, really, of the discipleship journey. If, you know, I, I like to say if, you're, if, you're, if your discipleship journey feels like a flat, predictable Midwest cornfield, then you're probably not following Jesus. Uh, following Jesus feels more like a roller coaster ride. It's up, down, up, down, sideways, and, uh, you know, it's hard to keep up with him at times, but, but it's thrilling, it's adventurous, it's anything but safe and predictable and boring. Mm. In your book, you use the following line, we must resist the temptation to run from the brokenness and counterintuitively, to, uh, yes, <laughs> easy word for me to say, uh, <laughs> counterintuitively run to it. Uh, resisting brokenness will transform us, but not for the better. Um, expound on that. Yeah, one of the chapters in the book is about transformation, how, how God breaks us to make us what he has determined we ought to be. So I looked at you know, the communion passage in the Gospel of Mark, where Jesus takes ordinary common bread, and when he gives the bread, it's something more extraordinary than bread. It's his body, whatever that means theologically. So, but before something as common as ordinary bread can become Christ's extraordinary body, his hands first have to break it. And I think the same is true with us. Before, you know, before average common folks like us can become extraordinary disciples, the hands of Christ have to first break us. And what I mean by by brokenness is is those seasons in life when we feel sort of dry, like we're in uh, in the wilderness, and God begins to expose uh, uh, some of the compromises, some of the inadequacies, some of the, uh, uh, the struggles, in ways that at first make us feel insecure, inadequate, inferior, and God doesn't do it to sort of shame us. He, he, you know, he's a refiner's fire. He turns up the, the heat on the, on the silver of our lives, not to destroy the silver, but to refine it, to, to bring all the impurities to the surface so he can skim it off. And the problem, though, is that our culture, at least the, the American culture, has taught us when we, when we sense that we're going into a season of brokenness, where uh, where we'll be exposed a bit, our weaknesses will be exposed. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're taught to sort of not run to that, but run from it. So when we, when we sense we're going into brokenness, we're, we're taught to sort of run from it, medicate it away, or um, 
uh, eat it away, drink it away, drug it away, sex it away, video game it away, um, even ministry it away, or work it away, or relationship it away. And, and you know, when, when we sense we're going into brokenness and we run from it, run from it, we, we, we tend to shortcut what God wants to do in our lives, and we miss out on really some of His greatest work. Uh, I don't know if you would say the same thing, Greg, but really it's been those times of brokenness, those times I hated in the, in the, in the barren wilderness, um, uh, fully aware and exposed uh, uh, to my nakedness, where I have grown the most in Christ, because I've learned to depend upon Him most in the brokenness. And, and yet so, so many times, and in, 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 even in Christian circles, we're tempted to sort of avoid that process of brokenness. And, and again, we shortcut uh, the process of transformation that God wants to take us through when we do that. You write that the differences between many professing Christians and non-Christians are difficult to detect. What's exactly happened? Yeah, well, I, I think that, you know, that's a generalization, obviously, because there are some faithful people on fire for God, absolutely. In every church I've been in, every church I've pastored, I've met sort of vibrant Christians. But um, I was in a conversation, really the book sort of started here, about 10, 15 years ago, I was I was pastoring in northeastern Pennsylvania, and um, I was in my hometown, and I, for some reason, I can't remember why, I was, in a, I was in a taxi cab. I don't know if my wife kicked me out of the house and took the car, I can't remember why, but I was in a cab, and uh, the the cabbie was Muslim, and we got into a conversation about religion, as you may have guessed. And what he said to me haunted me then and haunts me now, and, and he said it much more tactfully than I'll say it, but he basically said, you Christians don't seem all that different from the rest of the world. He said, at least for us Muslims, our religion cost us something. Now, I was blown away by that statement. What he said was a gross generalization, you know, that, but what he said was generally true. That, that I think what he was trying to say is that you, you Christians in America are more caught up with the American dream than with your Christian faith, and I, and I think he's right uh, in, in many circumstances. And uh, so, I, so I wrote the book, and that haunted me, and, and I had to write a book in response to that to help Christians move sort of past uh, cultural churchianity, past their notions of the American dream, and and toward what uh, what Christ said were the dynamics of deep discipleship. Mm. How do you think that um, people today are being immunized against biblical Christianity? Yeah, again, it goes back to what I said about uh, the American dream. So even in even in church circles, and by the way, I'm not anti-America. Uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but but there are times when American values uh, do not align with Christian values. So, for example, when it comes to consumerism, you know, uh, the American dream says, you know, climb the ladder, get all you can, uh, look the best you can, it's all about you, really, by and large. And And Christianity is not about sort of climbing the ladder, but descending it. You know, it's not about climbing, it's about stooping down to wash feet with Jesus. And so uh, uh, a lot of times what we do may be more American. What, what I mean by immunized is that, uh, for, I'll give you an example, a guy started to attend the church, one of the churches I pastored, and he's a really good guy, but I went through a series of sermons on, on deep discipleship, uh, you know, where Jesus talks about, you know, anyone who wants to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. If you love your life, you'll lose it. If you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. So I was, I was preaching on those t- kinds of texts, and this guy wrote me a long letter. He left the church, and at least he wrote me a letter, and he said, um, he said, your version of Christianity is too hard. I discovered later that this guy was listening to a popular health and wealth preacher who's on TV, and uh, the kind of preacher who says, you know, if you really have a lot of faith, if you really love God, God will bless you with wealth and health and happiness. And I was talking about, you know, the call of Jesus to pick up our cross and deny our quest for health and wealth and, you know, convenience and coziness and comfort. And so uh, by the time he got to my church, he was already what I call immunized. Uh, He couldn't hear the gospel as Jesus Christ would articulate it, 
because he'd already had a health and wealth gospel in place, and it's just sort of hard to overcome that. Obviously, one of the, the calls of the church is to um, offer discipleship, and and you actually question whether discipleship is actually taking place in many Christian churches today. Uh, talk to us about that, and if that's the case, then how do we actually turn things around and get back to the basics? Well, it, it, again, it's happening in some circles, uh, and it's really happening overseas in some third-world places where, where discipleship is uh, taking off in a big way, and it's happening in America. But churches that are doing it well are uh, are finding ways to do it. It's not just a program. It's more about connecting people uh, to God and to each other. It's about disciples making disciples. Um, I think if discipleship's going to happen, it's, it's going to take place, of course, in the context of community. Uh, we're not individual lone rangers. We're not isolated. Um, we have to uh, get people connected first to God, not even just to the Church, but first to God, and then in, in that context, in, in the community, um, for discipleship to happen. It's sort of, it, it's both theological and practical, too. There's, there's discipleship books out there that talk about uh, how God makes disciples, that it's all God and we have no responsibility, it's just God does it. And while I believe in the sovereignty of God, uh, God has decided for some reason to do his best work through this partnership between divinity and humanity. That's how the scriptures came together, that's how that's how we uh, conceive of Jesus. I mean, he is fully divine, fully human. That's how every sermon comes together. It's divine and it's human. And so the same is true with discipleship. We, God, God's the one who makes disciples, but we have to put ourselves under the fount of God's grace and do our part to, uh, for God to grow us. We're visiting with Dr. Lenny Lucchetti. He is the author of True Depth, Moving Beyond Cultural Churchianity. Dr. Lucchetti, if someone would like to learn more about uh, this work or what you're up to, is there a website that one could uh, visit to, to learn more? Yeah, I, uh, you can purchase the book at WPH Store. That's Wesleyan Publishing House, WPHStore.com, and, and there are some free resources there as well. Uh, there are churches that are doing this as an all-church emphasis where there are small group leader materials for free. There are sermon notes that go with the book uh, that are free. Um, you can also find the book on Amazon. Uh, I have a blog that's mostly for ministry leaders, for pastors. I write a lot about preaching and spiritual formation. Um, that's LennyLuchetti.blogspot.com, and I have a uh, Twitter as well, handle uh, Lenny Lucchetti. Okay. Uh, back to the book, you, you talk about that the fact that you think that the Church is still recovering from the age of reason. Why do you think that? Yeah, we, um, during the Enlightenment, we really uh, believe that, uh, you know, truth could only be ascertained uh, through scientific empiricism. That is, if something is true, verifiably true, it will have to be scientifically, empirically true, that you can put it in a test tube and out will pop the same results over and over and over again. And so we became pretty much rational beings, um, and of course God wants us to love Him not only with our heart and soul and strength, but with our mind. God gave us a mind. But I believe God not only comes to us through reason, through the mind, but He comes to us in some ways that betray our mind, you know, that, that sort of uh, go beyond human capacity to reason. And so uh, we have to let God be God. So God still shows up and does things in ways that oftentimes defies our logic. Uh, there are times when my logic and God's logic doesn't measure up. In fact, it happens often. And, and in those moments, I have to let God's logic sort of determine my way, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. The guest on Second Chances today is Dr. Linda Lucchetti. We're talking about the book entitled True Depth, Moving Beyond Cultural Churchianity. Uh, Dr. Lucchetti, do you believe that we have lost our sense of mystical wonder at the ways that God reveals himself to us? Yeah, and again, it goes back to that conversation about the Enlightenment, where you know we just we, we try to access our God through our minds, and and sometimes God comes to us through the heart. Uh, you know, we we can't limit how God reveals Himself to us. Of course, it will always align with 
the truth of God's Word as revealed in Scripture. But, you know, God might reveal something significant to us through another person. Uh, he might do it through a movie, uh, a piece of music, a work of art. And we, we've, we've so put God in a box, at least we've tried to, so that if he doesn't sort of come to us in ways that we've already predetermined he ought to come to us, um, we tend to miss it, like the Jews of the first century. You know, they believed in a God who would sort of send a Messiah, who would kick the tar out of the Roman government and put the Jews back on top again politically. And when Jesus came and he didn't sort of fit into that theological box of expectation, uh, many of them missed it. And, and I don't want us in this day to miss out on God showing up among us because he comes in ways that sort of uh, are outside the box of our expectations. You also write in the book that God has a track record of entering the space between the bullies and the bullied. Why does he do this? Yeah. Well, he did it with, uh, you know, the Old Testament really is the story of God coming alongside of a bunch of Hebrew slaves who were bullied by the uh, Egyptian uh, oppressors, and God put himself in the space between the bully and the bullied, uh, and, you know, rescued the Hebrew slaves, made them a great nation. Uh, in the New Testament, he does the same thing. When Jesus comes to us, he, he puts himself in the space between um, Jews of the first century who were being oppressed by the Roman government. He puts himself in the space between, you know, people struggling with leprosy and, and those who... Uh, sort of ostracizing them. One of the great scenes in the, in the New Testament is where Jesus comes into the temple, and uh, he overturns the tables of the money changers and, and drives out those who were taking advantage, basically, of those who were poor. So he put himself right in the space between those who were sort of bullying in the temple, trying to exploit people and rob people, and those poor peasant Jews who were being oppressed. And, and to me, you know, the Church's best moments have been the result of us sort of following Jesus in the space between the bully and the bullied. Um, you know, uh, we did that in the issue of racism and slavery. You know, it was the Church, really. It wasn't a political party. It was the Church that stepped in the gap between uh, racists and those who were slaves. Uh, it was the Church that really went to... Uh, some of the most horrific places in the world to build hospitals and schools and orphanages. So uh, one, of the, one of the places we experience the presence and power of God most profoundly is not in the safe place, not, not in the convenient, cozy place, but, but really in the space between the bully and the bullied, uh, between uh, human traffickers and those who are being sold as slaves, uh, between, um, you know, a lack of volunteers in youth ministry and and the youth who need mentors uh, who are adults. So, I mean, there's, there's there's so many things I can mention, but we we need to be the kind of people. The church needs to be the kind of people who who step in that space with Jesus and take on bullies in the name of Jesus and really liberate people who are who are captive. When it's all said and done, they finish reading the book True Depth: Moving Beyond Cultural Churchianity. Uh, what would you like the readers to think, feel, or believe uh, after they complete reading the book? I want I want readers to experience what my uh, my my son Sam experienced when he was six years old. He 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 was uh, he was in our community pool, and the whole summer he just stayed in three feet of water, the shallows. And uh, he had he had swimming lessons. He could swim in deep water. We knew that he was capable of kicking and reaching and swimming in the deep end with his brother and sister and the other kids. Um, but and he and he wanted to, but he was so stuck in the shallows because it was safe. And uh, so he stayed in the shallow end of the pool most of the summer. And we kept telling him, Sam, you can swim in the deep end. Go jump in the deep end. And uh, we tried bribery, as parents do. You know, Sam, I'll, I'll buy you ice cream. I'll let you watch your favorite movie. I'll, I'll let you stay up late. Just go, go, go try it. Go jump in the deep end. And he resisted um, until one day when my back was turned, actually. He, he jumped on his own into water over his head, into six feet of water. And he was kicking, and he was reaching, and he was swimming, and he was thrilled. Daddy, I'm swimming. Daddy, I can do it. And I said, I knew you could, Sam. 
And, and that kind of thrill is what I want Christians to experience as a result of what God might do through this book. I want Christians to, uh, to kick and reach for the deep end of the discipleship pool, where they're in over their head, where, where their heart is racing, where if, if Jesus isn't there, they're dead in the water, you know? But the good news is Jesus is there, and deep cries out to deep. And, and I want Christians to experience uh, a Christian discipleship journey that is vibrant, full of risk, full of adventure, full of growth, and not the stale, predictable, uh, boring thing that it's become in some circles. And of course, uh, when you talk about uh, people stuck in situations and things, I'm sure there are people listening to this program today that are not in the place in life where they really need to be, and they know that you know, what they're really looking for is the love that God sent by sending Jesus to die for our sins, and they're just looking for an opportunity to uh, pray and, and get their life set on the right track, and we always try to end this program by allowing our listeners to uh, pray if they would like to pray. And, and Dr. Lucetti, would you be willing to lead them in, in prayer? I would love to pray. Yeah, yes. thanks, Greg. Let's pray. God, if you are not with us, nothing else matters. And if you are with us, nothing else matters. God, be with Greg and those who are listening to this station right now. May they experience not a religion, but a relationship with you that makes life worth living, that they would experience the adventure, the thrill for which they were made, which is intimate, personal, eternal, life-giving, liberating relationship with Jesus Christ, your Son. God, we pray that uh, whatever kinds of brokenness and pain uh, these listeners might be experiencing, that they would find in you uh, the healing that they long for, healing that only you can bring. God, I pray that they would encounter you through the words of this station, through the words of my book. Multiply the bread and fish of my words and Greg's words and do more through them than uh, they would ever be without you in it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our guest on Second Chances today is Dr. Lenny Lucetti, the author of True Depth, Moving Beyond Cultural Churchianity. Dr. Lucetti, one more time, if someone would like to learn more about you, this book, or previous books you've put out, uh, give us that information. Yeah, my, uh, my blog is lennylucetti.blogspot.com, and uh, you can find the book and some free resources to go with the book, small group and sermon notes, uh, at wphstore.com, and the book's also available on Amazon as well. Well, we want to thank you for being a guest, Dr. Lucetti, and... Uh, you ever get back to Philadelphia very often? I do. A couple times a year I still have family in South Jersey and South Philly, so I, I do get back uh, for some soft pretzels and good pizza. And uh, maybe some crab fries? <laughs> you got, oh, yeah, crab fries. Ocean City, New Jersey. That's my. Uh, we try to go there every summer as a family, and we get the crab fries. All right, well, it's a good, good time. Dr. Lucetti, thank you so much for joining us here on Second Chances. Thanks, Greg. God bless you and your listeners. And tune in next week for more Second Chances right here from Advantage Radio Ministries on Lift FM.